Welcome everyone. My name is Shirley and I will be your moderator this evening. I am excited to welcome Dr. Paul Shivago, a leading clinician and educator on 3D printing for a behind the scenes account of his experience using Sprint Ray's new Pro S crown kit and ceramic crown resin as part of his full digital workflow. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A section and we will answer them live at the end. CE is not available for this webinar, live or on demand. Dr. Shivago, welcome. I will pass it over to you now. Thank you, Shelley, for the uh, nice introduction. Um, I will uh, start to share my uh, screen. Let me just do this quick. So here we go. I hope that um, everybody can see this. So just to talk a little bit uh, or to introduce myself, uh, I'm a prosthodontist. Um, I'm a, um, also implant, uh, an implant surgeon. I was trained in implant surgery. Uh, I work uh, in my private practice 90% uh, of my time and teach also at NYU. I'm the course director of digital dentistry um, at NYU postgraduate pros. And uh, <clears throat> I'm involved with SprintRay since a pretty long time. Uh, we, we have a, a really good relationship uh, since 2017. So that's really a long time for uh, this type of um, uh, collaboration. And I saw the company really evolve. And uh, where we are at this point in time, especially with this new product, uh, gets me uh, really, really excited. So uh, what we wanna talk about today is um, the 3D printed chair side solution that they have. It's called the Ceramic Crown. They have a, a also a, a crown resin, but this is not the Ceramic Crown. So the Ceramic Crown is actually um, something that can be used uh, as a, um, definitive restoration and this is really what we were talking about and um, I think to be a dentist right now is very exciting uh, because since uh, this uh, beginning this year the ADA um, gave all uh, 3D printed uh, restorations that uh, I apologize that have over 51% a ceramic content can be now uh, really used as a, a final definitive crown for our patient care. So that opens a really uh, a very um, a vast uh, uh, level of treatment options that we have and accessibility. So now you can really um, code these uh, under the CD uh, T2740 code and use it as a final restoration. So there are only a couple of things that really, I think, move the dental world and uh, I will name them. Uh, but I think like we're pretty much on one of these like new, uh, you know, benchmark times where we have, uh, you know, some really like innovative new things going on that I'm, I'm really excited and I'm, I'm honored to be part of it. So a couple of things that really changed our industry was obviously um, with Professor Brennemark, he um, found in uh, um, his ways by mistake by screwing in uh, titanium screws into um, uh, rabbit bones. He was an um, uh, orthopedic surgeon that we cannot remove titanium out of bone. And this was basically like, uh, uh, when we figured or he figured out that uh, what osteointegration is. And this was basically the birth of uh, the modern way of dental implants. They existed also before that, but he was pretty much uh, figuring out the way that we don't have failures. They stay uh, osteointegrated. And, and this was a huge uh, change in the whole industry. So now we could go away further from removable solutions. And we started to... Um, you know, uh, place implants. And that was uh, in uh, 1980, I believe in Toronto, he, he showed his studies and this was one of the milestones of dentistry. 
One of the other things that I really think, or for me, really matter was uh, when uh, Werner Merman uh, came up with his CEREC-1 uh, system in uh, the early 90s and made like uh, CAD CAM um, available for clinicians to have, uh, you know, available in their office. So the CEREC-1 could basically only mill onlays and inlays. And I was lucky enough that my father was a dentist in Germany. He was part of the first group to use it. Um, but it was the entry into this type of uh, dentistry. And then obviously like uh, Mats Anderson in uh, with Procera 10 years later uh, in combination with Nobel Biocare um, that used the Procera system were able to uh, manufacture uh, in mass, these uh, uh, CAT CAM restorations, which also moved, um, you know, dentistry in, in a completely different direction. Now, I think like at this point in time, there's two things that I'm really excited uh, about. So one, one is that we have now the possibility to basically 3D print um, grounds in our office that we can use for patients. And um, they're so accessible and they're very like, um, you know, easy to uh, design. And of course, uh, you know, what, what everybody's talking about, also a little bit AI. So being a dentist right now is very exciting. Uh, I think we should all kind of look at these things as uh, almost like a new era in dentistry and really embrace it and, and see where we can go with this. And I'm, I'm very glad, you know, to be part of this. Now, not only, uh, you know, this is not something that we only will benefit in the US, but we will have also to understand that like the majority of the global population uh, lives basically uh, under less than $10, $10 a day. So it's, it's, not, it's not just an impact for us to create more inexpensive restoration, but I think it will also bring uh, dental care or quality dental care and accessibility to that type of uh, dental care to the whole world. And, and this is really also something that is very important to me that, you know, we have uh, the possibility, we have the technology there, but we can also distribute it and, um, you know, help other people that didn't have access to that. And Sprint Ray does a great job um, with that. They uh, work together with Usain Bolt and we, we created some sort of um, outreach program where we will also uh, put these technologies out there, you know, to improve uh, dentistry in um, uh, places that don't have the access to that and, um, you know, will also have the need for dental care. Now, what happened, and this is obviously uh, the topic and it's a big deal. Uh, this is a material uh, that um, is called, again, the ceramic crown material. It comes in a, in a smaller size uh, bottle. Um, and it has over 50% of ceramic content. So it's FDA cleared. And uh, because this has more ceramic content than 50%, um, uh, this can be used as a final uh, restoration, mostly for single units. Uh, we will get into that uh, a little bit later, but... Um, you know, we, we have a study ongoing already and uh, we look at the longevity of these materials and how they uh, perform. Now for, um, or to be able to use this material, um, there's a special kit. So the uh, material is a little bit more demanding. So the printing surface, uh, you can see the printing surface here is smaller. So technically speaking, it will be able to print around six crowns um, at once. The time for that is an average of 10 minutes uh, for all six of them. It's, uh, it can be, you can add a little bit more crowns. If you play around with the settings, you can uh, do actually more than six, but uh, the recommendation is basically six crowns. And since uh, the Sprint Ray printer is a DLP printer, it doesn't matter if you print one or six or four, the time will be always around 10 uh, minutes. And I will explain also why. So the printers that really qualify for that are the Pro S series. 
So the Pro S series uh, printers are the newest generation of the sprint rate printers, and you can use the Pro S 55 or the Pro S 95. They work both, uh, but you have to have this crown kit that is displayed here. Um, this is a little bit something that, um, you know, I get a lot of questions. Um, I, I help the company to uh, develop a little bit the, the design for the study. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting questions about the material. I, I'm a little bit more experienced with that. Everybody's asking basically like, does it hold up? Does it break? You know, it's, it's the question that, that I get mostly. So there's like two things that, you know, I want to go over to explain a little bit how we have to look at these materials. So we're talking here about flexural strength and uh, the modulus of elasticity. So flexural strength is basically something that is uh, related to um, the hardness of the crown. So you can see like a 500, we have uh, lithium disilicate. Um, it, it's between 350, 500. So this is not my slide, but um, this is a material that's very strong compared to um, uh, lucite glass ceramics, which is more brittle, uh, but it's very close to the sprint ray ceramic crown. But I think where these materials shine is basically like in the modulus of elasticity. So if something is just strong and hard, it will also break if there's no elasticity. And this is where the modulus comes in. So when you have something like lithium desilicate where the modulus is really high, it means actually that it will break faster. So there's no elasticity or no plasticity in these materials. It will just break. So if you have, for example, a resin or a composite, you know that they have some sort of plasticity to it. And this is what the sprint ray crown has as well. Now, going a little bit back to dental school, if anybody remembers that. So this is the stress strain curve. So just to explain a little bit my following slides uh, that, that are coming. So we have like an elastic range where we basically have a material that will not change in the form in that range until it goes, goes to a proportional limit. So the proportional limit is basically when the material starts to uh, deform. <clears throat> but this deformation can also be plastic in a way that it will, or elastic in a way that it will reform to the initial form. Once it becomes plastic, it will change the form and will not recuperate. And this goes until you get to the ultimate tensile strain. Uh, where the material basically like deforms until it breaks. And this is kind of how to look at these materials in general. So <clears throat> let's look at enamel or dentin. So enamel is very strong, but doesn't have the plasticity like dentin and cannot be uh, under a lot of strenuous forces. So it will not... Um, uh, hold up and it will break faster than dentin, but at the same time, it's not um, as weak in the form as dentin is. So this is kind of like how you look at these uh, stress factors. And this is basically also like how you have to look at, um, you know, this new material, the uh, ceramic crown. So if you have, for example, you can see uh, in the upper left corner how metals work. So you have like something that is very stiff, but is tough and strong, but it has ductility. It, it will withstand like breakage for a long time. But then if you go into the ceramics, which is next to it, it's maybe like stronger initially, but will break faster. So this material, uh, the ceramic crown, is more comparable to how a polymer would behave, like a resin. So you have like a flexibility. Um, it's very ductile, but it doesn't break completely uh, to an amount that it will shear off or anything like that. And we have this study going on. And for now, 
we don't see results um, you know that show show us uh, breakage and I have also uh, done cases that I will show uh, a little bit later where we have hybrid ceramic materials uh, and we look at that and basically, this is where we started to kind of think of, uh, you know, coming up with this material that is a little bit more uh, as a final material uh, design as the ones that we had prior. Now, if anybody is familiar with um, other hybrid materials, maybe you guys can remember the enamic type of material that was done by Vita. It was basically um, a network of a resin infiltrated with ceramic. And I think it explains here a little bit the, the way these materials work in terms of the uh, crack propagation. So here we have like um, um, an object that creates an indentation in a, a silicate ceramic. And this indentation will propagate the, the stress and the crack line throughout the material and it will have a ultimate breakage. Now the dynamic material that had basically like a resin matrix in, infiltrated with ceramic would have also an indentation, but the crack will not propagate so far. So this is a little bit how to think of, uh, you know, the ceramic crown material. Now, what's really fantastic about this material, you don't have to really like buy these blocks and mill them. You have a bottle and you print them and you can print a lot of them and uh, it's really easily available for you. Now, in terms of the way to handle this material, um, it's a pretty straightforward process. And the whole process is also very uh, short in duration. So this material was designed uh, with the idea to have a chair side material. So basically the whole process will take about 45 minutes. Now, what happens is um, a very like straightforward workflow, the scan and prep part that every dentist uh, knows in, in the restorative sense, the design can be done in-house, can be also outsourced. Usually like uh, in my office, we design it in-house, but there is also uh, an AI design function um, that Sprintray has in their cloud service that would design it for you. The print in itself is about only uh, 10 minutes to cure it, wash it, and then rewash it. So this is a double wash type of like um, process. We'll take about five minutes each. And then if you want, if you really want to... Uh, make this material look really nice. You can also characterize it. And I will go over the workflows, you know, during the presentation. So 45 minutes is basically um, from the final prep until insertion that something that, you know, you can do in your office if you want to deliver this crown right now and then when the patient shows up. Now, in terms of... Um, the AI design. So Sprintray um, collaborated with TreeShape and they um, have uh, in their cloud, if you are familiar with the Sprintray platform, Rayware has also a cloud version. Most of us use the cloud version now. You log in, you have a lot of options in terms of like what restorations you want. And one of the restorations that you can uh, choose is the AI crown. And the AI crown is based on the tree shape model um, that they collaborated with. So you can basically expect in five minutes to have your case submitted and get an AI design back um, as a full uh, ceramic crown. Um, and I, I want to be perfectly honest, this is AI. You have to uh, make sure that your margin are perfect. You have to make sure that your proximals are looking also very clear. Sometimes if these things are not like proper done, this is not going to work. So this is a process that everybody is like working on, but it's very important that also the input is very clear and clean that this works out well. Now, basically 
what you do is you uh, upload your scans. Um, your scans will be approved or not, and then you will get an SDL file back that you basically print out. And this can be then used. Now, this is a little bit how the Sprint Ray Cloud Design um, platform looks like. So you have um, the um, uh, platform in the cloud design. So you know that you're working right now like on a Sprint Ray uh, ceramic crown. And we will go into the settings a little bit later. So the, the <clears throat> supports can be also the standard supports or you can also annotate them. The different design options, you can play around and choose whatever you like in terms of like how they should be you know, printed. Um, this is what, what I was talking about. So you need like the Pro S model for this. So the Pro S model here, the white one is the Pro 55S. <clears throat> it has more hardware and software inside and is able to uh, do these uh, crowns. So these crowns need different uh, type of like settings. Uh, I'm not necessarily an engineer, but as far as I understood, there's like something with heat compression and uh, all kinds of things that uh, the newer models of the printers can uh, do. And it's also important that we can print this in a certain amount of time. So 10 minutes, you know, at 100 microns, um, you can be achieved only with the newer machines and and this is why, uh, you know, this works only with the Pro S models. So you can see like when you put the crown kit on, on this picture, you have these uh, crown kit picture into the printer. So you know that you set it up correctly because it would look differently, it would say ready to print. And then your platform would be bigger if that's not the crown kit. So this is how it would look, you know, in the, in the correct way uh, to get going with the printing. Now, regarding the AI part, which I think is also very like exciting, I didn't try all of these uh, options out, but I definitely did the occlusal guard uh, option. So that's a pretty straightforward process. You basically um, upload a scan, you choose uh, the design, what you want. So in, in this case, let's say I would like to have the occlusal guard. Uh, it will come up with an occlusal guard in a very like fast manner. And, uh, you know, the, uh, time and the price for all these like uh, type of services are here on the slide. So some of them I think need a little bit more work. Others work flawless. Um, I'm, I'm glad, you know, to be part of a company that is already in it and is figuring all these things out. And I think that obviously everybody is aware that AI is going to be like a huge part of our lives. And uh, obviously dentistry is not uh, going to be like um, a part of it either. So uh, AI, in my opinion, is a good thing. And I'm glad that, you know, Sprint Ray already started to um, implement that in their services. Now, just for you to look, this is a very nice picture. We just magnified basically the uh, a printed crown to see like how it looks. So. Uh, this this one is not stained, it's just like polished and glazed. And uh, I think it can be really like um, seen as a very nice uh, final uh, restoration and can be given to the patient and can also be like a little bit more, um, you know, beautified if you want to. Now, in terms of... Um, Printing, I just want to explain a little bit, if you're not an owner of a printer, um, what this is about and how this works. So in terms of 3D printing, we have most of the time, resin printing is important in dentistry, or this is what most of the dentists have. So there's three type of resin printers. One is the um, traditional SLA, which is here on the uh, right side, on the left side, I mean. You have basically a laser that will trace the object, and this is a very accurate print. The disadvantage though, is that it would trace the object object by object. So if you print two objects, it will take twice the time as if you would print one. If you print three objects, it will take three times the time and so forth. So direct light projection printer, DLP printers, which Sprint Ray is one, they project uh, a light and will print the surface in one shot. So with other words, if you print 10 
or 20 objects and you lay them the same way on your printing platform, then the printing time will be the same. The only time when the printing plat uh, printing time will be uh, longer is when you offset them, um, you know, from the horizontal place. So you can uh, understand why I like that more for, for dentistry. We always deal with the maxillary and mandibular arch most of the time. So I don't want to use triple the time, you know, for, for the same thing. Or if you do orthodontics and you have to print like many models, you know, will take a, a long time more with a traditional SLA than a DLP printer. And LCD printers are also out there. They also function similar like DLP printers, just like that they, um, the light goes through an LCD screen. It's called also a shadow printer. And then that light that goes through uh, creates the layer for the print. Now, LCD printers are also great and they function very fast. I just feel they're a little bit, in my opinion, um, not as reliable as a DLP printer. And I rather, you know, have, uh, you know, a DLP printer in my office where I can leave it overnight and have uh, my uh, temps or restorations for the next day ready to go then have any surprises. But if you don't know anything about printing and you want to get into LCD and you like to tinker around with things and experiment, that's also a great printer. But let's stick to the DLP printers because we're all professionals and we want to use it for our offices. So um, many of um, these resins were developed a long time ago and uh, we try to kind of come up with better formulas. One of the um, most impressive resins that came out in the last, actually last two years because this um, industry has a very quick dynamic. So for example, the Onyx uh, material. The Onyx material is also a hybrid material that has a um, uh, porcelain content to it. And it's very like strong. So Onyx was designed for uh, long-term temps, um, um, temporary, uh, temporary uh, materials for hybrids uh, and, and things that really need uh, to be very tough and uh, very strong. Now, one of uh, the uh, first materials that were actually also designed as a final restoration was the Vaseo Smile Cloud material. Uh, which had like properties that were very nice in terms of the aesthetics and polishability and the colors. Um, and, and that material was basically um, also taken over by the Sprintbury company. And the first material that they made in terms of like having, um, you know, an FDA cleared final restoration material was the uh, sprint ray crown material. So this is not the ceramic crown, this is the crown material. And this was FDA cleared as a final material. This came like in all kinds of colors. And we had also some nice uh, successes with these materials. So this material was basically a precursor for uh, the final uh, or the ceramic crown material. But uh, for now, I use it only for my temporaries anymore. So I don't use this material, you know, for final restorations. Uh, but we did, and we looked at it, and I want to show you a couple of cases on this material. Now, I'm a porcelain guy, and I love, you know, my Emacs, I love the zirconias, and this and that, but there's cases where I want to help, and when the finances are not allowing us to move forward with, you know, the treatments, we have to have alternatives. You know, these materials can be very helpful uh, in many cases. And this is one of them. So I want to show you guys like this amelogenesis case that I did in my office. And, um, you know, it's it was really fantastic to have a material like that around to be able to help somebody. Um, and this, this girl uh, was uh, about like 14 years uh, when she came to us, and this is how she came to us. So she has uh, amelogenesis imperfecta. So this is a condition where basically the enamel layer is not uh, developed well. And over time, that enamel layer um, basically, um, you know, wears off or it's not even there. And this girl has a lot of like uh, sensitivity. It's very uh, in a lot of discomfort. And, um, you know, if you can imagine somebody with 14 years in school 
uh, it's it's also very tough for her socially um, to walk around like that. So she went to a hospital and they did whatever they could. Uh, so these are like more uh, acrylic restorations that were done. They didn't know what to do with it and uh, temporized her and sent her um, to us. And we figured, okay, so let's use one of these hybrid materials and really do something for this girl. And exactly the same workflow I'm using now with the ceramic uh, crown material. And we looked at this case for a while. So I did this case with my uh, associate, uh, Dr. Uh, Stacy Kersner, and um, we'll just go through it quick. So we like to basically take a lot of photos. Um, we uh, have, did an intra oil scan, uh, retracted um, pictures, and then we designed the first temporary uh, in ExoCAD. So usually we just do a markup. This is us working together over Zoom. And this is like our uh, initial design. And we run it also through an articulator because uh, the posteriors were involved. We didn't include the molars, but we extended it uh, at least to the premolar area. The molars were too worn down. We didn't want to go that far. And there was really no uh, uh, clinical uh, ground that we could have used. And this was the initial temporary. So the initial temporary was done uh, with the bisacrylic, with the mock-up. So there was not like a printing material involved here, but the casts and everything for the mock-up were printed. Now, after uh, we were able to prepare the teeth and clean them up, we designed them crown by crown. This patient had a very severe uh, class two occlusion. So we took that also in consideration and design every single crown individually. Now, after that was done, these crowns were also like printed individually. And uh, this is basically how it looks. So you can see like for all crowns, we spent about 36 minutes laid out uh, the way we did horizontally. So that's really a very, very short amount of time for <laughs> that many crowns. Um, and then we tested them on the models. So we polished it uh, again. So this is like the um, splintery crown material, not the ceramic crown. The ceramic crown has better um, aesthetic properties, but this is also okay. Um, and we uh, cemented the case. So these materials, since they are like hybrid ceramics, they will be cemented uh, with resin cement. It's the same workflow as you would do it for an Emacs or a full ceramic crown. And uh, honestly, the first time that I cemented crown by crown, uh, I was a little bit skeptical and, you know, I wasn't sure exactly, okay, is that something that will be a problem in a month, two months, a year, and this and that. And we, we followed this case for now uh, almost... Uh, two years or one and a half years, and there's nothing that really changed, which is fantastic. So, but this is like a picture that I wanna show you though. So this was directly at cementation, but this is like my favorite one. This was two weeks after cementation. So you can look at the tissue response. And this is something that I think is very remarkable. So the biology accepted it, it looks great. Uh, she did a great job in terms of, um, you know, the oral hygiene. But we can see that these materials are very like uh, biological, um, mild in terms of like, you know, we have like a good result and the tissue really shows that and the tissue doesn't lie. Now, um, this is basically the same girl after um, I think a follow-up visit, we, we see her every six months for cleaning. So um, we'll still monitor this case but this is basically the result. Now, going further, a little bit later, we started to work with the ceramic crown material. I did some cases that I have not documented yet with the ceramic crown, and it will be also available. But let's go a little bit over the in-office workflow. So it's basically the same thing what we do here. Um, we take photos, we take a lot of photos. So we have a, a photo room where we take a full face pictures for the design. And when we take like intra-all pictures, 
we have static um, uh, lights because I like that more than attached to the camera. I would, if it's attached to the camera, I move the camera with the light and I get like different shadows that I don't want. So this way I can control it better. Sometimes we take also um, polarized pictures for better shade, but this is like our initial workup. So once we do the preparations and what I'm referring to now is only single units at this point, this is what the ceramic crown is for. Um, the type of preparation, I would basically keep very basic, one to uh, 1.5 to two millimeters, um, maybe even less than, you can do maybe a millimeter as well, but keep it very like uh, similar to what you would do for full ceramic restorations. So the carbo surface where you have the margin, can be the only like uh, acute uh, spot. Everything else I would prepare round because that will uh, also absorb the stress and will also uh, make sure you will make sure that you don't have like any breakages. In terms of scanning, a scanning pattern is usually, I would say, I just from the occlusal surfaces of the molars. I usually like to go over the premolars internally um, on the lingual surfaces of the anteriors back to the premolar. And then I roll it over the incisal edges. So the scanning part has to be also very like um, done diligently. If you have um, single unit crowns, I would highly recommend to scan with the cord. I use a double cord technique. Keep in mind, if you're scanning, the light is basically capturing the margins. If you have an analog impression, you still have the luxury that there's some sort of like push in and pushes the uh, gums away. So you don't have that necessary with scanning. So be a little bit even more accurate or more diligent with cord packing when you scan. Now we talked about it, obviously don't have any undercuts, uh, keep the restorations um, round that you don't have any like sharp angles. And uh, it's, it's better to stay away from feather edge restorations because on the design aspect, it gets a little bit more tough in terms of, you know, uh, finding the right margin and so forth. Now, for this whole process, you have to obviously um, scan the area of interest, scan the opposing and scan um, the uh, occlusion. And I like to have a more a rounded uh, preparation finish line, a chamfer, a deep chamfer. It's easier to scan. It's also better for your restorations. Well, this is a very like uh, classic study, um, but it still holds up. So the rounded shoulder, or what we call now a chamfer, is probably the most appropriate uh, preparation style for uh, the ceramic crown as well. But basically, keep it the way you would do, you know, ceramic restorations in general. So there's no. Uh, there was no intention ever, you know, that we design some sort of product that will throw off or change your workflow at all. So in terms of um, my scan, so I, I use the matted scanner. I uh, like to, um, I have to take two occlusal uh, scans. This gives me also an idea how much room I have. Uh, if I have to reduce more, you can see like I pack my cord, uh, very nicely, so this is very important to me. Um, and that's basically the, the standard way of dealing with uh, the ceramic crown as well. Now, if you are done with uh, this process, you can go uh, into the Rayware cloud um, uh, platform. So uh, it's, it's, an, uh, it's a cloud, it's, I believe it's like uh, rayware.com, uh, you put your, uh, login name and you will get into this interface so here you can see already like uh, the crown kit 
and options that you have with the AI to design. So you would click here basically on crown and bridge. Um, then you have up there in the left corner, the clown design, the cloud design uh, interface, and it will give you like all kind of treatment options. So one of the treatment option is the AI crown. So from five minutes, uh, $15 um, to get this done. And you click through that whole, uh, you know, workflow. So what crown you do, what is your printer? Then you upload your files. Uh, once you have the files uploaded, it will tell you that the eye treatment was received. And then you basically get an uh, STL back if your margins and everything were proper and uh, it could be designed. And you upload this STL into your um, cloud and then uh, you start printing it. Now, when you're done with printing it, this crown material has a double wash type of workflow. So you basically print the crown. This one has to be manually washed. So my assistant, uh, Liz, is taking care of that here. And then you dry it. You put it in the cure. Uh, there will be a setting you know, that basically is for the ceramic uh, crown. You take it out again and you wash it one more time. So that's very important. So that's the only difference um, that is basically in the workflow compared to other materials. Now, once you uh, have the crown, you can now like polish it and you customize it. So we use the Taub um, company. They have like certain um, staining materials to uh, customize the crown. So I prefer a lighter shade that I can rather darken it than go the other way around, you know, where I have uh, something darker and then if I need something lighter, it gets a little bit more complicated. And after you polish, you customize it, I would recommend to glaze it again. And this way you kind of can also um, keep your um, customization, uh, give it more longevity because you kind of create a coat over it uh, that will stay there. And then you again like cure it and you can use it um, you know, now for, for cementation purposes. And the cementation protocol is pretty straightforward. So here uh, we use the Ivo Clean. Um, one cement that I really like is the Panavia V5 because it bonds very, very nicely to dentin as well. It's a very simple system. Um, <clears throat> you uh, clean the crown, you uh, dry it, you use uh, the cement, the resin cement, uh, based on um, whatever they recommend. You cement it. You can take x-rays and before and after. And uh, these materials have also radi radio opacity. So you would see your margin on an x-ray. And uh, you just cement it and adjust the occlusion if you have to, the proximals. And that's basically it. Now it's called the crown material, but I think it's a fantastic material for inlays, onlays, you know, indirect, um, you know, where, where you would do like an indirect composite. I think this is a better material. Uh, veneers, if you want, it's all, you know, part of the spectrum that you can use this material for. Now we push a little bit the envelope and we, I mentioned it, I did also bridges with this material. So far, um, I had one or two patients where we did anterior bridges. So initially I tried it out as um, um, a temporary and then that temporary was reprinted and then cemented. Now it's very interesting to see that like actually these materials are stronger when you once you cement it than if you uh, would bond it with temporary uh, cement. Um, so far I have an anterior five unit bridge in one of my patient's mouth. I'm still looking at this. It didn't give anybody any trouble, but again, it's just a very short time to really put the data out there to call it a new good example. So we don't really recommend for now like to use this uh, as a multiple unit type of restoration. 
but again, we're working on it and things develop very quickly. Um, one of the other things that I want to mention, so this is also uh, one of the materials that is not, um, you know, that's also very important and it's not the ceramic crown, but these materials have a really opacity to it. Now you can see here, we have an upper zirconia crown and um, an upper zirconia restoration and a lower um, denture that had actually a hybrid material. So this is basically like the um, uh, onyx uh, tough material. So it's so radio opaque that you can use it for a hybrid planning or um, as a surgical guide. This is very helpful. Now the ceramic crown material is not as uh, radio opaque, but comes very close to it. So you can use that for the same purposes as well. And I think it's a fantastic uh, thing to do instead of like playing with barium or back in the days we would put like guta perchas, markers and all these tricks that, you know, you just make a denture with these materials and use that as teeth and you're fine. Uh, this is how it looks when you overlap basically like a, a denture, or like a, the denture that was scanned with the CBCT. Uh, so it's very easy to match them. And uh, just a couple of things, you know, because we didn't talk about implants too much. Um, I would say at this point in time, everything implant related is very experimental. So there will be more coming out. Um, I'm involved in a couple of um, very interesting new products. And then where uh, I was introduced to it at the IDS and the International Dental Show in Germany. So that's also to do with 3D printing and, you know, advancements in that and implant restoration. I just, you know, for the record, some classic things. Try to keep, if you want to play around with it, cusps in the posterior, especially like as flat as possible, lateral forces in implants are going to be like um, very strong. And then if you have a material like that, that is so untested, you know, it could be like the weak link. Um, so keep decrease the cusp inclination uh, as also the offset of the implant. Um, and keep in mind, the further you go posteriorly, there's more and more uh, forces that uh, are, you know, exerted. So all these things really play a role in how you use the material and going back to what we said at the beginning. Um, there's a triad of things that really uh, matter in terms of if things work out or not. And uh, this is a little bit for me, like how I look at implant placement and the local factors where we look at the bone density versus the spread of the restoration, the splinting. And to be honest, if these things are all fall in place well, then it's very, very likely that uh, the material is also very important, but not the only factor that will determine if something breaks or not. Um, so I hope that this helped out a little bit in terms of um, understanding how these new materials fall in place and how you can use the ceramic uh, crown material. I love it. You know, I have it in my office. I can print crowns that I can cement now uh, as a definitive crown whenever I want. So I have an extra tool in my, um, you know, repertoire. And um, I thank you for, you know, listening to me. Um, I will be also this week um, in Vegas. Um, Henry Schein has a very cool uh, convention going on there with a lot of speakers. I will do a hands-on course on this uh, crown workflow. So it will be like, obviously we will be more involved. Um, thank you for your time. And I hope to see you guys in Vegas. And I think we can uh, go ahead with the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Shivago, for a very fascinating presentation. And yes, we are now going to open up the Q&A session. 
Um, and there are quite a number of questions here that I'm going to uh, bring over to you right now. The first is from Dr. Chris Pescatore. So his question is, if it is over 51% ceramic, the rest is in resin, right? Don't our direct resin materials have ceramic particles in them as well? I mean, I want to be very transparent. I look at studies that, you know, show me the material over time, how they perform. I do not have the formula of sprint ray, what the material is exactly about. Um, and honestly, I don't really um, mind that in terms of performance. So if resin materials have ceramic particles in them as well, that's perfectly fine, but I still cannot print them or design them making the crown and just in 10 minutes, I have something in my hand that I can cement with the resin that I squeeze out of the tube. So I don't know where this question is going, really. This is a different topic. Thank you. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. The question is, when will the ceramic crown kit be available through Henry Shine? I keep checking and still not seeing it. Hopefully soon enough. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is a question that basically Henry Shine has to answer. Great. And then we have another question here from Dr. Amy Guthrie. Why would I choose a printed crown over a milled enamic crown? So I have also uh, a mill in my office. And basically there's a bunch of reasons. So one of the reasons is that if I have an office that I would need, let's say like six individual crowns um, on six patients, I can do this in 10 minutes with a printer, literally in 10 minutes. So if it would take me like maybe like 15 or 10 minutes to mill one block, I need about six, six times the time, meaning it would take me an hour to do six crowns on a mill versus 10 minutes with the printer. Um, also the uh, value, the price factor, I think that all the printing materials um, have um, like the price of one bottle is less than the milling blocks. So, I'm not, I'm not against milling, I'm not against, uh, but I just think that if I can print something and it will give me the same result and the same satisfaction and it's, it's less expensive and it also, um, you know, is faster, why would you mill that if you can print it? I can basically, you know, invert the question. So it's faster. It um, looks pretty much the same. It performs very similar. Um, give it a shot. Thank you, Dr. Shivago. The next question is anonymous for an anonymous attendee. Right. Aesthetically, how does this compare to Emacs? I would use these for posteriors, but I'm a bit hesitant in using these for interiors where attributes such as translucency are important. Right. So the um i am not comparing this with emacs i love emacs you know emacs is a fantastic material i use a lot of emacs in my office um think of it in terms of like aesthetically speaking can you make it look like emacs yes you can if you have a skilled person that knows to stay in them and this and that emacs has different properties um it's studied over decades it's not the um, same material. This material has a different purpose. It has a purpose of like, you know, if you cannot use Emacs or you don't want to use Emacs, if I have to do this case, the amelogenesis case that I showed in Emacs, this will be a very costly case for this patient. So I cannot offer that treatment. And this material gives me an option where I can offer something very highly qualitatively good to a patient that cannot really afford these big treatments. And when we started to use like single uh, or when we started to use ceramic crowns back in the days, there was a lot of like 
questions are they breaking all the time they're not so good as uh, metal ceramic prawns and this and that i wouldn't compare it i wouldn't compare emacs with metal ceramic prawns but i wouldn't compare like printed uh, ceramic prawns with emacs either so it's just like an extra thing that you can use in your office and see for what cases you use it and then it's an extra tool for us so don't compare it just use it and then create your own workflow and see what comes out of it. Thank you, doctor. This next question is from Dr. Radha Sakdeva Monk. I have a few questions. Right. First, how do you manually wash the crown? Um, so there's like a master class on the Spinbury website. Uh, we basically have it all there. You can just watch the video, it's 12 minutes, not so long. But to answer your question, you just use a denture brush and uh, alcohol and brush it. That's basically it. Um, can the Rayway AI make inlays and onlays? I believe not. No, I don't believe that this is there yet. This is a very complex uh, form, an email, uh, like an only and inlay. It could be like all kinds of forms. I am, I never did one uh, at the AI. I'm sure it will come. Maybe like what we use for that is basically Exocad. Um, so if you wash the crown, it does not change the strength. And um, it the wash is basically like to remove the outer layer of the crown that is not cured or was still the material. So it's not going to change the strength. But the curing process does. So if you don't cure it, then you might have issues with the strength. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. This next question is from Dr. Jenny Chong. How long has this material been tested in vivo? Thank you. Um, so we started to test it in vivo in about like February. We have uh, 300 cases, 30 uh, clinicians all over the country. So we're waiting of results. It's a very straightforward um, you know, research that we don't really have any results but we will start six months to a year and so forth and then we'll just uh, see what comes out of it thank you doctor next question is from dr amy guthrie are you cementing or bonding these printed crowns so i actually use both but bonding will be for the final uh, restoration cementing uh, you know we use the temporary cement but the bonding part is definitely giving the crown more strength this next question is from Dr. Doug Starkey. Please discuss the disposal of manufacturing byproducts and waste. Well, there, what we do is we usually like um, don't have too much waste. The, the material is, uh, you know, there's a very small um, a resin bath for uh, the material. So the waste is very minimal. Um, I mean, I'm basically, I'm not sure where we, um, we don't have so much waste off it. So um, usually there's nothing in the bottle left that we use. There's also like a protocol that uh, Sprintray uses. I don't really handle this. Um, yeah, there's not much waste there. Thank you, doctor. This next question is from Dr. Nea Twaori. Do we have hands-on course in Charlotte planned in this year? Um, I'm not aware of this. So this is something that Sprint Ray should organize. I know that I will be in Vegas and I will have something in Connecticut. Um, yeah. Thank you, doctor. This next question is from Dr. Iris Panos. Can we print zirconia with the ray scan? Uh, no. So zirconia printing, um, just in general speaking, is uh, very difficult. I had many discussions with many manufacturers about this. Uh, we don't, it is out there, but it doesn't, doesn't really like uh, perform as zirconia that we mill. So at this point, I would kind of not even look into that too much it's it's not there yet in 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 a good way okay this next question is from dr gina skoltes will webinar be emailed i joined late yes this uh, this webinar will be emailed out to everyone who registered over the coming week 
This next question is from Dr. Jamad Abdi. How predictable is the shrinkage in terms of occlusion? Are the details in the occlusal surfaces of posteriors exact? So you have to think about it. So if you mill something, the milling, uh, the burr is basically more or less the determining factor how small details you can have. If you print something, the details can be extremely accurate. So if you want to design roofs and fossas and all this, like this will be like very clearly visible in a printed crown. So it's very, very accurate in that sense. <clears throat> Thank you, Doctor. This uh, another question from Dr. Radha Sakdeva Monk. Will these crowns hold up with a patient who is a heavy, bru I think, brusher? Bruxer. So, yeah, I mean, Bruxer. you have to think about it. Like, this is first of all, we designed it for now a single unit crowns. So, I hope that the Bruxer will have also some other teas remaining. Um, Bruxers can destroy everything, zirconia as well. Um, so I'm sure that if somebody has very heavy, you know, muscles, it will be also able to destroy this one, but this is very atypical. So we are not really worried about that and occlusion and all these things also play a role, like how much the, the preparation is, how thin and this and that. So it's, uh, it's not the goal. It's not the silver bullet bullet for Bruxers though. <laughs> Thank you. An anonymous question. What has been your remake percentage? Uh, zero. Because so far, I'm looking at these cases and nothing happened. Now, I'm not very worried about remaking these cases at all because you have these files. Meaning, if I have to redo these crowns, um, it just takes me a reprint. So it's not really something that I'm worried about at all. Thank you, doctor. This next question is uh, from Dr. Manisha Patel. Thank you. My first informative webinar about this. Well, you're welcome. I hope like you will join more <laughs> of these. And then we have another um, comment from Dr. Joseph Thomas. Thank you for a very informative presentation and the hands-on clinical applications. Thank you. And we have another comment here from Dr. Manisha Patel. I do have AI in the office, but no mill or print. What is the cost of investment? I mean, usually, like, I believe that um, with the sprint rate package, it should be something below $15,000. If you buy, like, you need, like, a couple of things, the, the, the printer, the material, the kit, the wash, and this and that. It depends. Now, if you're going into the milling area, it's more expensive. Um, now my, like the mills can vary between different mills in terms of um, how many axes, um, you know, if it can do wet and dry or it can change the uh, discs. And I mean, mills are usually more expensive. I also want to say something in terms of mills. Um, I have many 3D printers. I can operate them by myself. Uh, I can, my staff can operate them by myself. Uh, I have a very sophisticated mill that I love, um, but I did hire um, a dental technician to work the mill because that's already a different level of, um, you know, maintenance and uh, workflow. So it's a little bit more difficult to work with mills as well than printers in my opinion. Thank you, doctor. We have another question here from Dr. William Weil Isa. What is the difference from Form Labs printers LB3? So, a uh, Form Labs printer is the uh, SLA printer. So, Form Labs was my first printer. It's a great printer, but again, you have a laser that um, uh, is basically like um, printing every model one by one, so it will take more time. Um, and you have also to look in terms of um, what materials are available for your printer. So not every printer can work with any material that's out there. So if you buy like a Formlabs printer, you probably will not be able to use the ceramic crown, the spin-free ceramic crown material. 
the sprint ray has a very open platform it can use their own materials and other third party materials so definitely do some research on that please thank you so much doctor that is all the questions that we have for this evening um, thank you again for a wonderful presentation this evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight. We did record tonight's webinar, and we will email the recording out sometime over the next week. We would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. But thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on the future webinars. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Bye. Thank you, Dr.